Hey, Nuno. Hello. Hi. Good morning for you, I guess. Yeah, good afternoon for you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so. It's, it's been, a, been a little bit stressful. Um, I thought <laughs> I, I can was imagine. Only, I thought I was only handling the first three sessions. And because <laughs> um, I actually have two moderating. I'm doing a room this afternoon as well. So I was like, OK, really? I, I can do six. And yeah, I, was, well. I, I was very diligent reaching out to all my people, giving them the link. I did a dry run meeting with everybody. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, God, now I'm the worst moderator in the world for the other, uh, for the other three people. <laughs> you don't need to worry because uh, I knew that you were probably had to deal with a lot of stuff. And after COVID, we are all uh, online communication yeah. tools experts. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've learned a lot. So happily all the preparation i did with my first three has made it um easier to adapt um but nice. now I, after this session I'm, i have to reach out to these other three speakers um who i haven't yet communicated with um right. but it, you know it's i'm very happy you know um the the Geo, i mean the the buenos aires team sent everyone uh, an email in yeah, it was very clear yeah it was very clear and at your uh, solutions we have like 20 presentations so i also ask my colleague yeah don't worry you yeah. don't need to worry I, I i hope so i think i will be fine and unfortunately <laughs> Streamyard is pretty simple you just hit the link as it's long really as you, nice yeah yeah it's 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 very smooth and it's super um, nice and it's it it seems it's video is very lightweight um because yeah. When I when I at work I use um, Google Meets or or Microsoft Teams, and my if I'm on a long call, you know, yeah. my, my machine gets very hot. Exactly. And, and yeah. And goes on, and I've, I I'm having two separate videos because I'm I'm also watching the main presentation, <laughs> and my machine's like, what's going yeah. on? I, uh, it's true that I've noticed that, for example, Teams works. Well, first of all, sorry, you can see my screen, I'm assuming. Does everything um, look fine to yes. you? Yes, yeah, let me add it uh, for you. Ah, very nice. Let me see just if I can switch because I will show a nice map, the maritime picture of the world. Oh, God, awesome. That's a great data set. Yeah, it's a real time data set, actually. Yep. Cool. Uh, sorry for the interruption. No, yeah, yeah you're yeah. right about that because uh, when I use Teams and I have a quite powerful machine, I notice that the CPU after 20 minutes or 30 minutes goes super, super hot. Yeah. yeah. The fan goes on. <laughs> I'm like, well, I can I mean, feel my keyboard's getting hot. <laughs> well, no, I'm not there yet. I mean, my, key my keyboard is fine. <laughs> uh, so, um, so this will be the the last session, um, mm -hmm. and we'll start in two minutes. I, I've been starting one minute after the the okay. official time, and I'll just uh, give a very brief um, introduction to you and let you take it from there. I'll turn I'll turn myself off, um, mm -hmm. but I'll be watching the the questions and I'll um, I. I am you if uh, if time is an issue, you know, just one five minutes is left or or whatever, right. and then uh, and then we can uh, we can wrap up. So um, nice. thanks for your patience. thanks for your patience with the worst no, moderator no, ever. No, you are not. Don't worry. <laughs> you are not at all. And thanks for this quick introduction. I will ask a favor: if when five minutes are left, if you could put me a reminder on the chat, I will appreciate it. Yeah, I will do that thanks. exactly. Good. So looks like we are all set to enjoy some maritime data preview. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to it. How many points are in that data set? It's like billions, right? One hundred k. Yeah. Well, the full data set is billions of it. Is fifty million positions per day in real time, and yeah. billions of them in historical data. Yeah, so we have yeah. use cases where we focus on the real time. So we want to see the very last position and they yeah. are quite tricky because the storage needs to be updated and query at the same time. We have other use cases that have to query the historical data to build density maps, to do correlation algorithms with satellite data, for example. And then we have, well, smaller data sets, but that require a lot of enrichment. For example, fisheries, you need to know the vessel permit, whatever information you need. So you have like 200 attributes. Yeah, it's oh, nice. quite interesting. And on the mix, you have to total authorization rights, which makes all of this 
very, very complex to handle because you cannot pre-compute most of the stuff. So. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to hear more. And um, oh, nice. actually, that's a, that's a good segue. Um, <laughs> welcome uh, to the Puerto Iguazo room um, for the uh, sixth and last presentation of this morning. Uh, good morning if you're in North America or Latin America. Good afternoon to the Europeans and um, Africa. And uh, good evening to, uh, to uh, our, our friends in Asia. Uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Nuno Oliveira from GeoSolutions, who's going to be giving us a presentation on publishing maritime data with GeoServer. I'll hand it over to you, and I'll see you towards the end of the presentation for uh, the questions. If you have any questions, please put them into the application. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon. Well, we already did the, the good to everyone. So I am Nuno Oliveira. I am from GeoSolutions. I work there as a software engineer. And today I will be talking about maritime data. It's quite a use case. There is a lot of data to deal with, different types of use cases. So we have to ingest the data. We have to visualize it, do it at some time. Some of these use cases only have value at real time. So quite challenging things going on. Uh, the focus here will be on the, the, the geospatial visualization of the data, but I will, of course, spend a couple of minutes introducing the use case, the major challenges, and I will also talk a bit about the technical solution we implemented to ingest this huge amount of data, okay? Uh, as I said before, I work for GeoSolutions. We are a company that work, uh, that is specialized in dealing with geospatial data. Uh, I get we contribute a lot to open source. Some of our main the main projects we contribute with your server, map store, your node, your network. And in this case, I will present what what we call one of the customized solutions. So we use a your server, but we have to customize it a bit to basically match the let's say this very particular and uh, performance wise requirements of it. We have to customize a bit your server for it. So the use case itself is dealing with maritime data. So, well, I guess the first thing when we hear maritime data is about boats, and that's true, but there's also a lot of other stuff going on. So, well, of course, boats, ships, vessels, the way, the way there is a small difference between all of them, but they basically, they tell us where they are on the sea or we detect where they are. And then there is all the other maritime sets the physical infrastructure itself, like ports, uh, navigation aid systems. I guess if you ever went sailing, you saw them. They typically help the vessels. They warn them about some dangers that may be under the water, things like that. All of these data sets basically is what here I will be referring to as maritime data. So uh, in this, let's say, in this use case, uh, we had basically to consume all these different source of data and we had to merge them together in some way so we can we could provide views of all of this data that could help let's say several entities make on the fly decision sometimes those decisions can be done a bit later so we can use historical data we have done some of them need to be done at real time and the key here is interportability because all this organization needs to communicate with each other. We have different sources of data and everybody will kind of need to understand each other. Tools will need to be able to consume data for different sources and so on. So here I will focus more on the vessel positions is the most complex one to deal with due to the amount of data and the, the let's say the performance criteria associated with it. So uh, for this system, we had basically two streams of two main inputs of data. So streams of data coming from different sensor types, IIS, terrestrial IIS, SAT IIS, and other types of like VMS for fishing vessels. So we had to deal with all those sensing information. And we had also what we call enrichment. So for example, we have information for several organizations about this fishing vessel. If his permit is on, on up to date, eh, with type of fishing nets used to fish and so on. So in 24 hours of data, we receive around 50 million ship positions and we have to handle about uh, half million different 
uh, ships, okay? And in terms of other maritime assets, we are about 100K. So in total, 600K uh, different type of maritime entities. And of course, we have to deal with packs of activities at certain moments of the days in particular areas, for example, busy ports during the day. And so the system was designed to handle uh, at least 2,500 messages per second. So, uh, we add the data, we have to consume the data, and we have to provide several scenarios. Some of these scenarios uh, require real time. One of them is visual, of course, the, the ship positions in real time. So for each vessel, we need to see where it has been last reported currently. Is it near a port? Is it in the middle of the sea? Uh, we have other use cases that can rely on uh, historical data typically density map. So we take, we have billions of positions in our storage and we need to compute the density maps for them. So we can understand where typically vessels go and do other type of more advanced analysis. Uh, well, that's basically the two, uh, two cases. We have another one which was displaying uh, na navigational charts through GeoServer. For those who know a bit of this topic, it's quite a complex topic. But anyway, there is something that produces those nautical charts, the electronic ones, and we publish them in your server through WMS and WMTS. So now, an important aspect. We have all of this, uh, let's say, all of this amount of data, all the use cases. And on top of this, we have to deal with authorization rights. Of course, you guess that this is sensitive data, so not everyone can see everything. And depending on who can see something, it will completely change the view of the system. This makes, uh, let's say, it adds an order of magnitude to the complexity of the system because it doesn't allow us to pre-compute a lot of things. We just need to be very performant in reading it. It's easier to say, but difficult to implement. So. I without uh, uh, spending too much on describing the use case because I want to do a demo on the end and need to stay on time. I'll talk a bit about the technical solution. So this is a very high level uh, view of the infrastructure of the system we implement. So we have here our, let's say, our um, inputs, streams of data, enrichment data. We have a Kafka uh, cluster that works as our buffer and as our temporary retention system. So it receives all of this message. And then the, the processing was implemented on Kafka streams. So it reads from Kafka. It does all the enrichment, all the processing, and it stores them, in this case, in an Oracle exadata. We, we didn't have much to say about the data storage. That's what was in place. That's what we had to use. Later on, I will talk about other storage. And then we add your server. We had to very efficiently read from Oracle and produce all the things we need, which means that we use WPS for heavy computations, like on the fly correlation of detected vessels on satellite imagery with real existing positions, serving the real maritime picture with WMS and provide information about the vessels themselves with WFS. So uh, that ingestion quick overview. So, well, uh, the description is easy. Do it efficiently is, <laughs> again, a bit hard because we need, we, we, we let's say, we need to store that in a, an efficient way. But at the same time, the, the storage, in this case, Oracle will be also queried by your server. So we need to balance the two things. So we cannot have very expensive, very expensive indexes on the database because it will make the writing slow. But we need to have some index because otherwise the reading will be quite slow. So there was a lot of turning here that happened, a lot of performance testing and measuring. And once we find the right balance, so we implemented the solution. And of course, then there is all the data processing, enrich it on the fly, uh, detect things that are out of order, reject them, detect invalid positions. Well. I guess you can imagine the type of things. All of this was implemented with Kafka streams and a custom solution to efficiently read from Kafka intermediary storage and store directly on Oracle because we really need to have a full control of the query sent to Oracle. Okay, now I'll, I will point two things we had to in your server, two of the major challenges. One of them was to be able to efficiently write your spatial data on the database, in this case, Oracle, and be able to read it in a very fast way. Our first approach was to use a spatial index. It was very efficient in reading, but not so efficient in writing. Remember, we need to write up to 2,500 messages per second in different tables, in different views. So the number of writes 
in the Oracle database can go up to 100K. So it's quite a lot of inserts. So special index summarizing very quickly. We could not use them. So uh, Juicer was extended to be able to read directly latitudes and longitudes from the database and build the geometry on the fly. So which means that on the database side, we can use numerical indexes, which make things super efficient and things work just fine on the GeoServer side. Now, what do we do with more complex spatial operators? Like give me everything inside the complex polygon. So basically we compute the bounding box of the polygon. We do the gross filtering on the database and then we do the fine grained filtering. It works quite well. Later on, I will, uh, there is now other, uh, a different technological landscape where these things, we can support the same amount of writing and have a more efficient index. The other thing to take into consideration is advanced authorization. I will give, be, be very quickly over this. Long story short, GeoServer is responsible for all these authorization rights, which means that a, a custom component has to be developed to integrate with other organizations authorization rights system, which provide on the fly, look, this is the authenticated user. It cannot see ship positions that come from Portugal, but it can see them if they are in the Atlantic Sea or something like that. So all of these rules have to be interpreted in real time, converted to an SQL query, and happen to the SQL query in an efficient way that was sent to the database. Quite a, quite a topic on its own. The other aspect was highlighting. So we are displaying ships going on on the map, and there is a bunch of stuff we want to highlight. So I want to see all the vessels that are fishing with a non-European flag, that are sailing with a non-European flag, and that have not reported in the last 10 minutes. Uh, I want to pick these 10 ships and see how they go around the world, if they meet with each other, maybe to do something illegal. We don't know. So. Here, there are two challenges. Typically, we need to highlight thousands of objects and they are moving, which means that we cannot do multiple requests, one with the image, then with the lighting, which is a typical way of doing these things. Everything needs to be done at the same time because remember, it's a real-time system. Things actually are moving on the map. If we do a request to get the real positions and then one with the lighting, the lighting may be here, but the position may already be there. So this was quite challenging too. And now I will do a live demo. So I will take uh, several use cases. So this is the density maps. I will not actually show the map for it. Long story short, here we have to consume so billions of positions and we had for uh, each vessel type, cargo, tanking, military, laser, fishing. We have to compute the typical uh, density maps for it. This is very useful for do all sorts of analysis and algorithms to plan maritime infrastructure, to do maritime planning and so on. Uh, we typically compute it for all Europe. It's quite a process. There is a workflow in Airflow to implement all the computation and all the raster data is published through GeoServer. Uh, the other thing we implemented was serving electronic and nautical charts with your server, WMS and uh, WMTS. A couple of challenges, but it works very nicely. And uh, this means that you have all of this implementing and be in your server and be served with OGC service, so with super interportability. It's easy to integrate with OpenLayers clients, with CliffLev clients, with QGs and other OGC compliant clients. Okay, so now I will do a bit of demo. And uh, as it had to be, you had to open the wrong window. There we go. So this is the real maritime picture as currently in the world. And it's basically being displayed on a polar projection. The position, the styling of this position is based on the sensor type. So blue typically SAT IS, uh, black typically terrestrial IS. So this is a real time picture. Uh, I will show, jump to another example. So this is one with a more nice style. So there we go. I need to resize the image. So this again, all of this is happening in real time. So thousands of positions are being inserted on the database and we are querying them with GeoServer. So this styling is basically painting all the vessel positions according to the vessel type, so cargo, leisure. So if I click on one of them, and this is where things will become interesting, 
if I click on one of them, as you can see, this is a test client. I'm obviously not sure. This is derivated data. It's not, <laughs> if you look for this vessel, it will not be at, the sea at this moment. So if you look at these attributes, we have uh, around 115 attributes. Because remember, this is enrichment for everything you can think about. Fisheries, security, uh, azimuth information, whatever. So we know this is a tanker, if I'm not missing, a cargo vessel actually flying under the Spain, uh, sailor under the, actually, I don't know this country. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm going to do a filtering here because we can filter on all of those attributes. So that's also something to take into consideration. So let's say I want to say all the vessels uh, that are cargos right now. I will actually do it like this. I want all the vessels that are a cargo or that are a tanker. These usually are the big ones and they behave quite well. So there you go. So we can see in in green the cargo vessels and in red the tanker ones. Okay. Another interesting view that we typically like is the target edge color. So this will paint the vessel according to the last reported position times 10. So what's the idea is to be, be able to very quickly understand if a vessel has basically stopped reporting, which may indicate that you had some issue uh, or that is something doing something that uh, it doesn't want other people to know about. So most of vessels are well behaved. So for example, if I go here, I can filter, show me all the vessels that have not reported uh, in the last 10 minutes. There we go. And we can see there is not a lot of them, actually. So if we go to, by the way, in the total picture, we are displaying more or less 100K uh, points on the map. And as you can notice, the rotation is performing at all scales. This was quite difficult to impl implement in a performant way. But when you are analyzing a map, it's sometimes it's useful to see where the vessel is actually going, in which direction it's going. Uh, if we, let's say, show me all the positions that I've reported in the last minute, we can see there is quite a bunch of them. So mostly around Europe. And if we move them up slowly, we can actually see them moving because, uh, well, because it's a real time system. So of course the final client is a lot nicer, but well, I had to show the test client. Uh, okay, let me see the time. I still have three minutes. Uh, this is one of the filters basically based on the phishing information. So this is quite important, typically for organizations that care about phishing data. So typically here I can say, look, show me only all the vessels that are fishing vessels. And we can see that they are quite colorful. Typically the color here is based on the type of gear type they use. So that has a meaning for people who investigate this type of things. So if I click, for example, on this vessel, okay. If we go to the fishing information, you'll be able to see a uh, type of information about, I don't know, the, the gear type, the FAO type, et cetera, et cetera. So moving very quickly to another example, this is, this is quite a navy map to load. It will take him a bit, a couple of seconds. It's basically highlighting all the, I choose this one on purpose to show that oil efficient is highlighting. We're highlighting all the cargo vessels in red that have not reported in the last 10 minutes. And the ones in pink are the ones that are not uh, sailing under an European flag. So not in the flag of the Euro an European country. If I go near Portugal, so this one, it takes a bit too low. We can see in real time, we can monitor this type of fish or of vessels. The combination are endless. We can basically use any, any of the 200 attributes to define our highlighting. As you can see, there is the different types of highlighting, full and just the border. And uh, if a vessel is highlighting by multiple rules, so the highlighting will grow like we can see here. 
Uh, one last map to show and I'm done. Okay, this is about search and rescue operations because we also integrate that type of information. So I asked about, uh, for example, in this case is an aircraft that is doing a search and rescue operation. We can see the track of the aircraft. Here are basically all, you know, those things that see that help, pe that help people navigating on it to understand these dangers. For example, here can be someone with those huge fishing nets or uh, installing a uh, an underwater cable. And basically they tell, look, be careful here. Uh, this is, for example, a search and rescue uh, transport transponder that is uh, emitting. So we computed the track so we can see its derivation on the sea in real time. And this is another interesting use case. Is my last one, more 30 seconds. It's basically about correlation data. So we have a satellite that goes around Earth. It takes picture of it and it needs to identify uh, the vessels that were there. Why? Because if vessels typically want to do something illegal, spilling oil to, on the sea, do some trafficking, I don't know, they typically uh, don't want to say where they are. So that's why we need to do our best to detect them. And uh, I can show you the final result. Okay, I will need to log in. Okay, great, I was actually already logged in. So here we go. If I go here just very quickly and I'm done. So this is, we can clearly see this was one satellite picture over Europe. And this is only the final result. So they are the gross results, not filtering out. And basically what happened is that we take the, after the satellite image has been processed and say, maybe there is a vessel here. We try, we have an algorithm, algorithm that we implemented that we look at the billions of positions we have and try to predict what was the candidate. For example, here was a very good one. Look, at this time, there was only this vessel around and the predicted estimate was 43 meters, which is a perfectly acceptable uh, distance for such computation. There is more corner use cases, for example, like typically in airports where we have multiple candidates for the same vessels. Uh, for example, here, here we go. So here we have two vessels that correlated with the same, sorry, two possible positions that correlated with the same vessel. And clearly one is the right one, this one, and this one is a face uh, correlation. We have another process to clean this and I'm done. Well, done. There is, for the future, tracks displaying cloud, other technologies and things like that and better integration with historical data and I'm done. My apologies, Michael, I spend uh, one more minute. No, no, no apologies necessary. There's no session after us, so we can take the questions right all the, all the way cool. uh, to the end of um, the end of the hour. Um, I do see a couple of uh, good questions in there. And um, but first of all, you know, thank you. E excellent Thanks. presentation. And um, I'm, I'm a bit of a data science wonk and love to see how you broke down some of some of these these problems. Real, really cool stuff. Thank you. So it's an amazing data set too. It's kind of incredible that it's yeah. open data because you know we've seen a, a wide variety of uh, people working with it and uh, breaking it down in all kinds of different ways. Had never seen some of the the, the approaches you've so, taken. Nice. So, Thank you. Um, the so the first question is: um, Did you look at GeoMesa's Kafka data store for supporting live views of the AIS layer? Yes, oh, we had a look at GeoMesa. Uh, the main reason that GeoMesa was not, uh, let's say, selected for the final implementation was because of the techno, uh, let's say, we had to stay within a certain uh, bunch of technologies, Kafka and Oracle, so that didn't suit uh, well with that. That's one of our next steps. There's a bunch of new technologies, GeoMesa, GeoSpark. There is also stuff like Databricks that have some nice SQL views. We actually did a test with GeoServer where we make GeoServer directly connect to an Azure data lake through the GDBC, IVE GDBC driver. And it was a lot more performance than what we expected. We're able to compute an historical real-time maritime picture one year in the past for a particular hour in less than seven seconds which is not bad at all. Very cool. Um, and the other two questions seem to um, be digging in on some of the chart the chart files you were using. So um, I'll give you the first question. Um, both seems to be a, a, a good deal of interest in this. Um, uh, multiple people have agreed with the question. Um, okay. 
I had to use ArcGIS server with maritime extensions to get the S63 chart files to work. We also did some work to extend GDAL to use IHO encryption library, which allows us to use S57 and S63 files with map server, but we aren't using it in our system yet. I'd like to know how you did that with GeoServer. Right. So, uh, well, nautical charts is quite uh, quite a topic because they are not free. That is not something we can. They are very expensive, and so typically there is a, a, a paid client, which is uh, in our case is CMAP that is being used behind the scenes. So, let's say the organization we work with has a license for that CMAP, and we integrate directly with that client. So, GeoServer as a connector to CMAP, it connects to that component and it retrieves the data it needs, basically the maps, and then make sure they are displaying according to OGC standards. In this case, mostly WMS and WMTS. What do we mean? A clear API that can be very easily integrated and that is quite efficient as we have shown. Of course, the extension on GeoServer allow us to configure the different stylings, the different stuff we want to see on the nautical charts, the detail, the label detail, and so on. And the the last and related question is: How do you handle electronic nautical charts in GeoServer? So I guess you partly answered that, but maybe. Right. Well, but th th that's a good question because they can be quite configurable. So it really depends on the, the component that also let's say provides those electronic shards, and they typically provide an API where we can configure the stuff you want. In this case, in your server, there is an UI when configuring the layer. I say, look, I want the full one. I want to see everything that exists on the sea. Well, we can do it, a bunch of checkbox. Or look, I want the very basic ones. I want to see the coastline, the, I don't know, the most important things that will add my navigation, and that's it. All of that is configurable. A layer is published in your server, and it's available through its OGC services. Uh, as far as your server is concerned, the source of nautical charts is like any other data sort. It's like an Oracle database. There is options, we check those options, and we publish the layer. Great. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, you've got uh, Nuno's uh, email um, and Simone's as well. If you want to reach out to uh, the Julio Solutions crew to get more information on this, I'm sure they'd be happy to engage. Um, it's been a great morning. I have learned a ton um, across a wide variety of things. Um, I hope everyone rests up over lunch, um, does some of the social activities. And um, for those of you interested in QGIS, I'll be in the Salta room in, this afternoon uh, with, with a bunch of great talks there as well. So uh, thank you for participating. And in about one minute, I will end this broadcast and uh, close this studio. Uh, great work, everybody. And thank you so much, Nuno. Super awesome. Thanks to you. Bye, Al. Ciao. Okay. Thank you.